help us channel our inner poet. Round of applause. I'm here to talk about the heart of poetry, which is not meter or rhyme or even musical language, but which is one of the most unique capacities of the human brain, one of the oldest technologies we have, the ability to make metaphors. As the poet Wallace Stevens says, metaphor sees nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. It's the ability to make comparisons, to see the similar things and to unite them. I'll give you a very simple, simple image of this. This is what separates the reporter from the poet. The reporter says, that's a tree. The poet says, oh no, that is me. I'll get more in that image later. But what I want you to see is that metaphor allows us to see things not for what they are, but for what they could be. Now, why does this matter? Well, because there's two things I know about each one of you. One is that you probably hate poetry because of what high school did to you in English class. And two, each one of you wants to be happy. Isn't that right? Anybody want to be happy? Come on. All right, well, how to be happy, right? There's an ancient Chinese proverb that your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits inform your character, and your character defines your destiny. So if you want to change your destiny, you have to change your thoughts. The problem is you have to use thoughts to do so. And so borrowing from the recovery community, you don't think your way into right action, you act your way into right thinking. And what I am proposing is that metaphor is a way of actually talking your way into right thinking. It's a way of actually changing your brain's patterns. I discovered this about a year ago when I began, when my life really began to fall apart and I began to suffer with terrible depression and I began looking at how I could hack my brain to become happy. And I discovered this work. And there's four points spread very strangely across this slide. I'm gonna talk about one of them how to label your negative emotions. And that is to use the power of your brain to apply words to these things. And what this even more bizarre slide says is that when you actually name an emotion, what it does is it, it engages your, your oh, I'm sorry, it engages your amygdala, giving it power over that and separating your brain from that negative pattern. What this book, David Rock, actually found is that when you engage symbolic language, it gives your brain even more power over that negative emotion. It engages your prefrontal cortex in which your brain uses logic to suppress those negative emotions. So let's go into this sentence. The idea of saying, I am angry. Instead of suffering in your anger, when you simply just say, I am angry, it gives you power over it. What I don't like about this sentence is it creates a self-identity of anger. I become my anger. I become my sadness. I become my depression. I propose instead saying, there is anger in me. It creates a separation with words in which that anger becomes simply a presence inside of me. I can choose to keep it. I can choose to let it go. Now, the metaphor that we can now apply is instead of just saying this, saying, what if I realize my heart is a furnace? My heart can have anger. My heart can have love. My heart can have compassion. That furnace can be used to make bread. It can be used to warm a home. It can be used to destroy. And what I then acknowledge is that my heart is not negative for having it in there. That's simply the fact of my heart. Now, in my case, I have, over the last year, suffered from terrible anxiety. And if I actually, if I self-defined as that, I became that anxiety. But if instead I realized my anxiety is a pool around me, and what I need to do is sit up, take a breath, look up, see that there is light, and I can, in fact, still breathe, it gives me control over that anxiety. If you are feeling lost, it wouldn't be a January 2016 presentation without at least one David Bowie reference. So if you're feeling lost without David Bowie, what you need to realize is you're not lost. You're, in fact, stuck in a labyrinth. What do you need to do? You need to find your baby brother, stop listening to the Goblin King, and get the hell out of there. If you are feeling powerless, again, turning to David Bowie, maybe you are floating in a tin can. What do you need to do? You need to say, this is Major Tom too. That's right. You need to call it to ground control. You need to reach out to help. You need to realize that that's who you are. Well, I saw this in myself as I was preparing for this talk, visiting the grave of my grandparents who passed away and reflecting on the year that I've had in my life. And this shame began to well over me. And I thought, I'm giving a talk on this topic. What can I do to get rid of this shame? And I couldn't come up with a metaphor. I couldn't come up with anything. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look around. I'm going to see the first thing. I'm going to compare myself to it. And so I saw this tree and I said, how am I this tree? What I realized is that I and this tree were very similar. We both were here in Texas. Our roots were in this ground. It draws life from the very bodies of those who went before us, just like me. And what I realized is that tree does not apologize for the fact that it is not a rose bush. That tree realizes its purpose is to stretch its branches up into the air, to extend its leaves, and to transform the very wind of the cemetery into beautiful music. And I began to get a sense of peace and the shame disappeared from me. So what I would encourage you to do is when you suffer from those negative feelings, use the power of words, use the power of metaphor to engage that prefrontal cortex, to suppress that, and to see that there is in fact a way to be happy. And the way is poetry. Thank you.
Thank you, sir.